and all together. Now, uh, as I was mentioning last time, the, um, these are the essential paths on a graph, yes? From starting from each of the four points of the graph before where they can start. Yes, so uh, you have four, four starting points. And those are the essential path, and you can build them easily. You see there's a multiplicity there in the middle, two, where you have a linear combination of three things with the property that the contraction is zero. So the, uh, the property that we used for this essential path uh, was that the, uh, if you contract two adjacent, two adjacent levels, the contraction is zero. Now, if you go, for instance, here, this is a difference between two, uh, two paths, which you should write like this. Yes, I'm, I'm going to. I'm going to change a bit the lighting. So you see it's this difference, and when you contract uh, these two levels, the contraction is zero because the edges are different. If you contract these two, then you, you, you subtract these two. So let's write it like this. This is a contraction. The image at the right is from quantum field theory, and the others you keep. That's a, that's a picture, so the edge below you keep. So you're going to get uh, an uh, edge which is two times uh, sh uh, with two shorter. So now, um, the idea was, uh, remember that uh, if you, uh, if, uh, we showed that if you take uh, any starting point above a graph, you orient the graph D any way, in any way you want. For instance, you can orient it like this. And each of the points from which you can take essential path, which are these points, each of these points will give you some numbers, so a representation of the, uh, of this quiver. The longest one is this. This is the longest, uh, this should be the longest path. Oh, it's actually even more, you can go, uh, let's see, so from here you get a single path down here, from here you get pass up to, up to there, from uh, up here you get pass all the way. So there, there's, uh, there's one more which I'm going to put here. So all of these, from each of these you get a representation of the, of the quiver D4. And uh, the multiplicities that you get, for instance, if you start from here, you see, this was our path, so if you start from here, you're going to get uh, up to here one, one essential path, up to here one essential path, up to here none, because this one, if you would contract it, there would be nothing to, to counter it, yes? And down here, you get one as well. You see, it's, it's uh, as shown here, yes? And uh, the theorem of Gabriel was that if you take the roots of type D4, uh, this, the, this sum, the root here plus these two sums, this, this sum of simple roots gives you a root. Yes, so this is just a motivation uh, thing. So each of these gives a root, a positive root. each of these points, as long as the essential path touch the graph at all. Otherwise, uh, they're zero if they're too far. 
And uh, there are exactly as many points from which you can touch this graph as, uh, so they, they end up actually here. So you have one, two, three, four, once, twice, three times, yes? So you have three times four, which is 12. There's none here, this one is too high. So these are the points from which you can touch these graphs. Uh, notice, for instance, the one here, yes, there is a path of what length, which ends on the graph, downwards. Length, zero, yes. So this gives you the map C goes into zero, into zero, into zero. Yes, that's a representation of the quiver here, and it's one of the indecomposables. So these are 12 roots. Now what you see here are the uh, 24 roots of type D4, exactly the ones on the blackboard, on this. Yes, so uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the way they're represented here is uh, you take the sphere S4, so they're in a four-dimensional space, they have the same length. You take the sphere S, uh, S3 in R4, and uh, you take them as vertices. One of them is at infinity, so you see here 23 of them, yes? And, uh, and so half of them are positive, and, uh, uh, and uh, these are it, and you see them, uh, we, can, we could label them and, uh, on some models, which we're going to give after the course, uh, these roots are labeled. Yes, for the AN, uh, for three-dimensional things, you can make very easily models. Now, uh, the idea then is that what should we take as roots from the blackboard? Yes, from the comment there. Well, each point gives a Each point gives a root, yes? So this point here gives the root one times this plus one times that plus one times that, yes? So the conclusion is that the points are roots. So we can skip the whole process and we'll take, as, uh, we'll take the points here as being the roots. Now uh, let's define it more precisely. So is this clear? Every point here gives you some representation by essential path, yes? This representation is read as a sum. The dimensions are read as a sum of simple roots uh, and you get all of them this way. So we're going to define now the ribbon now of type ADE and we'll put it over SL2. You see why? This ribbon is the Cartesian product of uh, this AD is a graph G. This is a graph. Is a Cartesian product of the integers mod 2n. This is a Coxeter number. Product over Z mod 2 with, uh, with uh, the graph G. So this is the definition of the ribbon. So in this case, in the case of the D graph, the ribbon will be the following. We'll have the graph D here, and we're going to take one copy. So this is a level zero, one, two, three, 
three, four. So here for D4, N is equal to uh, six. Two times four minus two, that's a formula which is six. Yes, so we should have uh, the roots go up to level It's a bit short here, 9, 10, 11. Yes, and we'll end up on the next blackboard. That's what, uh, so this allows you to take uh, Coxet uh, up to about, uh, I don't know, uh, Coxet 30 for, the, for E8 would give you something of length 60, which would be just right here. So that's what we're going to do. 11 and then 12, I'm going to draw it here, but remember that 12 is the same as zero. Yes, so this glues to the top. So it's a, it's a ribbon, it's a cycle. Yes, and uh, the point, so the reason for taking it over Z2 the reason is that this is, uh, this is a bipartite graph. The AD are bipartite graphs. So in general, you may, uh, we'll skip that in more general situations. And uh, so we should, uh, make a sign here that we take it uh, periodic. So uh, uh, this is the easiest way to, uh, com to compute the roots of a uh, graph of type ADE. You should compare the theory with something which has appeared in uh, in rep graph representations, it's called algebra representation theory, with the uh, um, Auslander Reiten. Quiver. Which arrives at a ribbon in the case of SL2 uh, but it arrives as a derived category starting from representations of quivers. Uh, the construction is very complicated and uh, what it misses is a, fact, is a connection with uh, representations of SU2. So this, is, this part is, uh, is entirely new. Uh, so let's, uh, um, now on this, Quiver, uh, so on this uh, uh, ribbon, uh, as I said, the dots are roots, but this doesn't give us the geometry of the roots. Yes, and uh, remember now that uh, that the essential path, the number of essential path, this is a dimension of the essential path from uh, between A and the point, a generic point, that this is bi uh, harmonic. So the delta uh, in the direction of the graph minus delta vertical of this function f is zero. Yes, so they would have, uh, as you see here, uh, the, for instance, for this point, one plus one is equal to two, you see? Yes, and analogously. So, These are the biharmonic function. 
the function is vertices verts of ribbon into R. And in fact, the, these, uh, these uh, take integer values. Now, uh, if, we, uh, if we complete one of uh, those uh, functions, so let's take, for instance, this one starting here, we'll have one, 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 uh, here one, one, and one, the rest are zeros. Uh, notice that here you have one minus the one two levels up, yes? So here you have zero. So here you have zeros all over. Zero as well, because this is this has one neighbor minus the one above. So this is exactly like the uh, like uh, the the table, like Pascal's triangle. But uh, I'd like to call it a moderated Pascal rule in which you subtract the thing two levels up, yes? So now you're going to continue here with a negative one, do you see, because here the sum of neighbors is zero, but you subtract the one two above, right? So it's a negative one and it continues with negative one here, negative one, negative one, negative one, negative one, and then it's zero down and it restarts. This is, this is uh, nicely periodic, which is quite a surprise the first time in which you, you, you see that no matter what thing you take on the, what numbers you put on the graph, say six, is going to have exactly the period two times the Coxeter number of E6, which in that case would be 24, yes? And uh, this rule, this biharmonic property was coming out of the fact that sigma tensor uh, sigma k is equal to, is isomorphic to sigma k minus one plus sigma k plus one. This is, this is the, in the, these are in the irreducibles of SL2. And this is uh, the uh, degree one, the spin one half, yes? So if you tensor with the spin one half, you're going to get the one before and the one after, yes? So this means that sigma k plus one is obtained by tensoring with sigma one and then subtracting sigma k minus one, which is two levels up. So this rule is, is, uh, is due entirely to the, to the tensoring with, uh, of the representations with SL2. So these are the biharmonic functions. And as you can see, the biharmonic functions, biharmonic functions determined are determined by these two levels, two adjacent levels. So if you know the values here, you can find these and you can continue down, right? And you can put on these two levels anything you want. Yes? So, so the space, so it means that the, uh, I want to keep that, so I'm going to lift uh, this blackboard. So it means that the dimension of the biharmonic functions on the ribbon of G is the number of vertices of G.
So in particular, for the graph D4, the dimension is 4. So the idea here behind this is that is to answer the question what coordinates should we use in the linear span of roots or weights So those were those vectors which were giving us eigenvalues of representations. What coordinates should we use? We could use, uh, of course, uh, rectangular uh, Cartesian coordinates are out. We could use the inner product with simple roots, but that would break the symmetry. So let's write here instead of These just taking the inner product with the graph uh, G will take the inner product with any root. So we'll use for this four dimensional space 24 coordinates. Now, of course, this is overdetermined. But overdetermined by what? Can you, you probably can guess right now. How are the coordinates going to be? There's just one thing on the blackboard. They're going to be biharmonic, exactly. Wonderful. So the chords will be biharmonic. So this is the amount of overdetermination. So if you choose a, uh, if you choose these 24 coordinates, then uh, the the results will be biharmonic. And we should put one more thing. It's connected to the to a homework which was given a while ago, that on the ribbon. We're going to show on the ribbon the the move move to down on the ribbon is uh, exactly the coxeter element, which I'm going to define this is related to the solution that uh, James uh, found. Um, so if you have simple roots, then each root gives you a reflection in the hyperplane perpendicular to it. And if you take the product of reflections for simple roots, you get a transformation which is called the Coxeter element, which will be crucial in everything that we're doing. And uh, on this ribbon, the Coxeter element is just pushing everything down by, by two. Yes? And uh, it's a nice uh, exercise, actually. Um, it involves just a little bit of uh, computation to show that if you have a Coxeter element, so there are, of course, many Coxeter elements, if you have a Coxeter element, then you can arrange you, your points on a ribbon. So the, the, if you have uh, roots at, uh, at, uh, 
random, there's no particular choice of ribbon, but choosing a ribbon is the same as choosing a coxset element. Yes? Uh, how would you solve such an exercise? Well, if you know the coxet element on the ribbon, then you know the orbits of this. Yes, there's the orbit of the first point. If you apply the coxet element, then the orbit of the second and so on, and we can take inner product between elements of orbits, yes, and recover the ribbon. So the information in the ribbon, in arranging the roots on a ribbon, will be exactly uh, the choice of uh, a coxet element, of a product of simple root reflections. And everything related to roots is much simpler on this, uh, on this ribbon. Now, uh, there's uh, one theorem, but I'd like to leave the, the proof of that for the uh, for, uh, next time. Um, namely, Namely, what uh, what we need now to do, so we, we have decreed that the points are, are roots. We are not going to prove it uh, through cla by, by a long reduction to the classical, uh, the classical situation, but rather show that they act as roots. So this is the duck method in which you make the thing quack. And if it walks like a duck and if quacks like a duck, then it must be the duck. So we're going to make, show that these, uh, that these dots act as roots. Yes, and that would be the proof that they are roots. Now, uh, what about the geometric structure? of roots on the ribbon. Well, consider the, the dots as orthonormal vector, as an orthonormal basis. And now, take the Dirac mass at one, so one at a point, and uh, zero else at a point which is point, which is a uh, root, and zero elsewhere. Now, if the coordinates have this property that they are biharmonic, how could you get the geometric root in that space? You need to get this point in the space of biharmonic functions, because those are coordinates in the root space, yes? So there's only one possibility, namely, you just project it on the biharmonic. So the projection of any point on the biharmonic, any point viewed as a base vector on the biharmonic subspace is up to a scalar and try at least to guess this scalar before we'll, we're going to prove this, is up to a scalar exactly the geometric root.
namely this continues the theorem. The inner product of uh, A, so this, these are points on the ribbon, of the root, at, root A, of the root of A with the root of two, B, is exactly a scalar, a common scalar, times uh, a constant, which is constant for the whole ribbon, times the uh, uh, times the projection of a projection of b, and. Uh, here's the, the computational part for this. The, uh, the inner product of any root of a point A with the other roots, which means the coordinates, the coordinate of root A. So A is a point on the ribbon. This inner product is equal to the uh, fusion down from A plus the fusion up from A, which I'm going to describe in a moment. So here the fusion This is a name uh, used by physicists. The fusion is exactly the number of essential paths, the dimension of essential paths. Remember that the essential paths were obtained by tensoring with, uh, with the elements of SL2 at some root of unity. So those are fusion tables for physicists. You start with the top vertex and you tensor first with what to obtain itself? You, you tensor with a trivial representation, yes? Then you tensor with the, uh, with the generator. And remember that the graph is a graph of tensoring with a generator. Yes, so you're going to get the neighbors on the graph that way, on the row two. Yes, and then if you count, if you continue to tensor, you would get quite a bit more than here, yes? But you subtract the one, two levels up, because if you keep tensoring with the, with the if, you, if you take pass of edges, those correspond to tensoring with a generator many times in a row, yes? But the main theory that we use here is the fact that for a group like SU2, if you tensor many times a generator, it will have a highest weight irreducible in, in the tensor product. So the, the whole idea, this was Weil's central idea of developing uh, the representation theory of, uh, of uh, simple Lie groups, semi-simple Lie groups, was that there are some generators, you tensor them, and the tensor product will be decomposable into pieces. But then there is one piece which you have not obtained earlier if you give uh, uh, the right uh, 
right ordering for sizes, yes? So there is one new piece, and that is this highest weight irreducible, and this way you get all the irreducibles of uh, the group. Now here we use it for S SU2, but what you should notice here is that all these ideas work in a much more general framework, namely not over SU2, but over any semi-simple Lie group. And this would allow us to do mathematics over any semi-simple Lie group. And in fact, if we do exactly what we do here, instead of over SU2, if we do it over SU3, we'll get the higher ribbons and uh, the higher roots, uh, exactly what's in the title of, uh, of the course. If we do it uh, over SL4, all this, then we'll get the, uh, the, the, the math higher with two, and this is high in the sense of uh, category theory, which normally is extremely difficult. And there was no, uh, not even an attempt to make a, uh, in the sense of higher category, to, to get the simple Lie groups, the higher simple Lie groups. Uh, there was not even an awareness uh, that they exist. Now, can you see somewhere on the blackboard? You should be trained to see things. Can you see somewhere where, where uh, we have eliminated shorter things? in the tensor product. Yes? Hmm? Right there, uh, it's, uh, it's that uh, annihilation. Do you see in this picture here, in this picture, this is equal to zero since, since we mapped a highest weight this is tensoring with what representation of SL2 sigma this is tensoring with the generator sigma 1 sigma 2 sigma 3 sigma 4 yes dot tensor so this is dot tensor sigma 4, yes, and we have mapped it into something which is of length 2. You see here. So every time we get, so these essential paths are tensing with irreducibles. These irreducibles do not appear earlier. So if we find anything that would map them into something shorter, that should be zero. Yes, and that's basically the definition of, uh, I mean, an alternative definition of this simple, of this essential path. Yes, when we'll, when we'll go further. So now, <laughs> Uh, the, the inner product uh, with the, uh, with with the longer and shorter, you can see that here. Uh, well, first of all, uh, I should make one more it's a fusion, we should put here one more thing. This is equal to the fusion down from A minus the same shifted by two. And you'll see it on these pictures. I make, will make the pictures available on the web. Uh, look at the, uh, you, you, you may recognize there the uh, essential path from the graph D, yes? So we took them with the numbers 
and we, sub we took them here in blue, let's say, and we subtracted the same shifted down by two, by the coxet element. Yes? And look what numbers we got. Do you see the, the black dot is zero? Yes, the blue dot is one. And uh, the red dot is here negative one. So you can see that, uh, you can see that although there is a, you see there is here two, yes? The difference here is two minus one, which is one, right? So the statement is that the inner product of the root here, which should have been marked better, I'll tell you exactly how. So the inner product of this particular root on the ribbon with the other dots on the ribbon, which are other roots, is exactly this difference, yes? Except at the point here where the marking, the correct marking should be what? The inner product of a root with itself is two. Yes, so all of these should be two. And they are on uh, this, I, I have used, I must have used uh, an old file. Where does this two come from? Remember that when we continue this essential path upwards, after a little gap, do you see, they continue with negative one. So the difference there is two. Look, uh, look, please, on the blackboard up here, yes? So this particular root times itself is two times this one is one uh, times this is negative one, 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 and so on, yes? So this gives you the inner product between roots and is obtained in two different ways. You either... Uh, which are, according to uh, that picture, they're, they're easily equivalent. In one of them, you take the fusion downwards and you add the fusion upwards from the same point. Yes, but the fusion upwards from the same point is, as you can see, the negative of the fusion downwards just shifted by two. Yes, so if you do this, then you'll get uh, you will get all these, uh, these inner products. And uh, a nice thing, uh, when you, if you have some time and you come into uh, Jefferson uh, 250, when I'm not here, you can, uh, or when I'm here, you can try to find the simple roots uh, here in the D4, yes? and make a correspondence with the ribbon, yes, the inner products. Uh, the, the convention here is that if there is an edge, then the inner product is one. If there is no edge at all, the inner product is zero. Any circle contains what's a figure, if you, if you have looked at the crystallography of, uh, of uh, root systems, any circle should have what's the main figure in that? It's a hexagon. Yes, roots are at, at uh, 60 degrees. So any circle has uh, six points on it. Yes, and it is, a, uh, it is exactly a hexagon in crystallography. Yes, so uh, you should find here the simple roots, here, fine roots, they, they lie very nicely. Try to find them on a cube, and this, this picture would give you the inner product. We'll do the proof next time. Um, maybe in two times from now. What I want to show, so look, these, are, these continue. Uh, look at a graph like, uh, like E8. Which, is, which has uh, very big multiplicities. You can see there are six, uh, sixes and so on. So here, do you see here six? But the difference is zero, as you can see. So the difference, amazingly at first sight, the difference between these fusion numbers is always negative one, zero, one. Yes? And uh, I should, uh, 
advertise here a little bit for the, uh, so this, these are from the graph E8, yes? All these numbers are just zero, one, or negative one, and the top ones are two, the bottom ones are negative two, just the inner product, product with itself, and, uh, and inner product, uh, uh, and the opposite. The inner product with a negative would be negative two. Now, given this fact that you move up and down, uh, I think you're ready to guess what should be the, inner, how would you compute the inner product for something like SL3? So SL2 has two directions. Yes, you can go up and down. In SL3, you have not three, but for SL3, you, we shall have six directions, which are called the vial chambers. So for SL3, the directions in which you take the fusion, let me make them like this, are these. So you can compute here tensoring with the representations of SL3 in one direction. You go in all six directions, you add them up, and then you find that the higher roots of SL3 have length square root of six. So they have inner product with themselves six. Yes, and uh, the inner product with the others, just like here, will be some number between uh, negative five and five. So always an integer. So you find the Euclidean structure of the higher roots. And with those, you can do higher root, uh, higher, higher representations and, uh, and everything. Uh, so here again, what you get are the roots out of fusion. Yes, just out of tensing with the, the representation of, uh, of SL2. Yes, so the statement here is exactly that if you, uh, well, first of all, that if you take fusion down, fus the fusion shifted here, like two, yes, it's the same as, you see by that observation, is the same as adding it in the two directions, yes, but the statement is now exactly that the inner, that what you get this way, yes, is exactly the inner product of a root with the other roots. And this is exactly also the projection. So if you project the Dirac function one at a point, exactly at the top point, yes? If you project it on the biharmonics of E8. So what's the inner product of biharmonic functions? Oh, the inner product of biharmonic functions, uh, you can simply take, uh, take just the sum of, uh, so you can take uh, the, the values it is in a product of functions, yes. You have to normalize it by, by dividing by something like the Coxet number square or so. So uh, up, to, up to a common constant. The inner product of one of these with the others, now that's a very good uh, question, yes, is, is obtained point by point. You just take these to be coordinates of a vector. They are the same up to a scalar, exactly. Yes, they are the same up to a scalar. So uh, that, that's a beautiful part of the symmetry. Now, what what uh, uh, Zhang Gui, well, Gui questions uh, uh, means, at least to me, yes, is the following: we have two vectors, these projections, yes, and they have an inner product as projections. On the other hand, we have here some uh, some numbers. Yes, for uh, for root inner product with the others, but because of the symmetry, these two are the same up to up to a scalar always. Yes, so it, what this means is that uh, 
We all learned since there was a requirement for this course, you remember, which was only linear algebra there. So uh, since we have all learned in linear algebra that you take an orthonormal basis and then you sum the inner products of coefficients, yes? However, in this very symmetric situation, although we have way more, uh, way more uh, numbers, way more coefficients, we have a whole ribbon of coefficients, yes, uh, we can still use the same uh, formula as if they were orthonormal. And we'll get the same number up to a scalar, which is your homework to find, so just guess it. In this game, you have to guess, uh, guess things and... Uh, um, yes. So, uh, what are these numbers, an alternative view of these numbers? Yes, if you have a root, a root is a vector. Yes, the inner product with that root is also a distance. Can you explain it in terms of mirrors fast? Yes, yes, you have a root, this is a root, the inner product with this root. Uh, yes, more or less, so let's, let's normalize the root to one, for instance, right now, just for this argument. It's basically, you know, even simpler, it's the distance, distance to the mirror, yes? So what you see here, these numbers that you get, here they are plus one and negative ones, there are a lot of roots, here, yes, for E8, there are 240 roots. Uh, since uh, one root and the negative have the same mirror, yes, these are the, but you can count it the other way. In any case, these are the 240 distances to mirrors. These are called the vile mirrors, yes. The mirrors, so every root, the hyperplane, which is orthogonal to the root. So the distance to these mirrors is what you see here. And a lot of things are, de are defined in terms of these distance to the mirrors. For instance, um, uh, you'll see, so I, I'll just, oh, I'll spend the zero amount of time that we have telling you that, uh, that for instance, there is a, a, an extremely useful vector, it's called the vial vector rho, which is a first point, first integer point, which is of, of what? If you have a lot of mirrors, the mirrors change sign, so they annihilate anything that goes into the mirror. So you need then the first point, which is not, yes, it's not, how? Yes, which means it's not in the mirrors, yes. So you need the first point, which is off the mirrors, yes. That's a vial vector rho. So you fi we'll find the vial vector rho here as the smallest, uh, by harmonic function, which has no number zero. Yes, because a number zero would mean that it's, it's on a mirror, yes? So we'll get this way very nice expressions in terms of the ribbon of the vial denominator, so which is exactly that, and uh, all the dimension formulae which involve distances to the mirror, they'll be just numbers on this ribbon, yes? But the numbers of this ribbon have a concrete meaning. They are counting essential path, yes? So we'll not only get the uh, vial, uh, vial formulae numbers, but those numbers which will mean actual dimensions. So much more, much better. I'll stop here for now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So this is, uh, so here we're going toward, uh, toward the higher theory, yes? 
I was telling you that the way to work with such things while you're packing, don't stop, don't stop, yes, is always to try to work out a simple example. I, for instance, here you work the D4 example in full, but in full detail, everything about it, yes? You maybe make even a sculpture for it, and you try to solve everything by very general methods, yes? You should be aware that the graph D4 is, uh, is uh, uh, I mean, that there's nothing, nothing random about it, so you try to find it, find everything by methods which work in general, yes? And that's, that's what this course will do.